Hi there, I'm Gideon Rose, editor of Foreign Affairs. We're very lucky today to have with us Dick Betts, one of the grand old men in the field and one of the wisest commentators on American national security policy. Dick is a professor at Columbia, the director of the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies there, and the author of many books, including most recently, American Force, Dangers, Delusions, and Dilemmas in National Security. He's also the author of a wonderful new piece in our latest issue called Pick Your Battles, about the lessons of the last decade of war. Uh, Dick, we've had the longest stretch of continuous combat in American history. Uh, it's gone badly. The wars haven't achieved much, and everybody's unhappy. What are the basic lessons uh, that you take away uh, from this last decade plus of combat? Three main, <coughs> three main ones. One is that uh, we should fight wars much less frequently, but when we do, more decisively, erring on the side of uh, doing too much to engage the enemy uh, rather than too little. Uh, a second one is to avoid getting into situations where success depends on controlling the politics in local areas uh, where the situation is basically chaotic and where local politicians have their own goals that uh, usually don't overlap with ours. Uh, and if we promote democracy as we naturally do, we enable them to follow their own course and to do things that uh, are against our interests. And the third one is that there are important security problems to worry about, and we should be paying more attention now to uh, what used to be the main preoccupations in defense policy, and that's dealing with potential threats from great powers. In this case, Russia, which is back causing mischief, in part because we uh, uh, provoked their pushback, but also China, uh, which is growing and naturally flexing its muscles. Let me take your second point for a second. You say uh, avoid getting entangled in local politics. You're a good Clausewitzian. Isn't war all about politics? How can you avoid politics in war? Well, you should avoid getting into a situation where uh, you want to have the good guys come out on top in a civil war, but you're not in complete control of the contest, and you're not even in control of your own allies. Uh, conventional wars between states uh, lend themselves more easily to Clausewitz's point, uh, where the issue is really determining which country comes out on top in a military engagement. A civil war is a, a messier, more complicated situation. And if you can't control the local politics that uh, determine what your ally in the civil war is doing, then you're doubly handicapped compared to uh, an interstate war. Why? Is it so hard for Washington to stay out of these messy conflicts in seemingly peripheral uh, areas? Well, for a long time, it wasn't hard. There was a long period after the Vietnam War when there was a lot of reluctance to get involved in situations like this. Um, but especially after September 11th, uh, there was a tendency to uh, conflate or blur the difference between the war on terror and challenges in places like Iraq uh, and Afghanistan. Uh, and also, since it had been 30 plus years, uh, the trauma of Vietnam had worn off. And we'd also had a tremendous success uh, in at, right at the end of the Cold War in the first war against Iraq in 1991. And that tremendous success, I think, made it easier for presidents to believe that we could accomplish a lot at reasonable cost with military power, which led to a couple of miscalculations. So is that actually a silver lining? I remember you saying uh, in the run-up to the Iraq War, when everybody was worrying about whether it would be uh, a failure, you're saying you worried almost as much about whether it would be uh, a really easy success, because then it might tempt us into dramatic, uh, even larger and more reckless engagements. Is the fact that our uh, we, the United States got its nose bloodied badly in the last decade and a half in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, has that at least insulated us from even stupider mistakes down the road? Uh, well, for some time now, I think the uh, tide of opinion is clearly against uh, getting involved in similar uh, problems, and that's why there's this mantra about no boots on the ground, even as we try to use air power to deal with uh, ISIS, ISIL, the Islamic State, uh, problems that seem to demand attention. Uh, so I don't think it was the great success in Iraq the second time around that uh, is doing this, but uh, the, the failure essentially in Iraq, even after we patched together a rickety but uh, functioning uh, 
government and, and left uh, quickly became revealed that we hadn't been able to deal with the basic problems, which are internal Iraqi politics and ethnic divisions. Uh, and there'll be uh, tremendous pressures against trying to do it anywhere else. There will, though, similarly be pressures to try to rely on air power when we see situations that we're worried about and that politicians think demand uh, uh, military action because air power seems to be a way to have a military impact without getting militarily entangled. Uh, I think that's also potentially a dangerous uh, a source of miscalculation, but at least it poses uh, fewer risks of uh, getting stuck in a quagmire. You talked about great power war, the potential for it, and the need to be remain vigilant about it. We're now many decades into the nuclear age. Uh, any kind of great powers, that the ones you're talking about, China, Russia, have nukes, as do we. Uh, why is great power war, is it realistically still a possibility? Isn't the nuclear era one in which that's been banished from, uh, uh, from the nuclear powers? Well, unfortunately not. Uh, first, people forget that the uh, early phase of the Cold War wasn't anywhere near as stable as the later phase. It took three crises over Berlin, a crisis over Cuba, to sort of work out the limits of how far either of the superpowers could push. Uh, before that, <coughs> uh, there was a lot of uncertainty, probing, uh, and dangerous miscalculations that could have gone the other way. Now I think we're in a similar phase in that uh, the Russians are getting frisky again, uh, I think uh, in significant part because we thoughtlessly pushed them around for 25 years after the Cold War, and now they're pushing back and we shouldn't be surprised. But what happens in Ukraine or potentially in the Baltic states uh, is much less uh, clear in terms of how far either side can push uh, with, uh, without the other uh, going up to the brink of war. And until we work that out, it's going to be more dangerous than the latter part of the Cold War was. And similar with China, uh, we haven't really clearly made a decision in the American government or the American political debate about what risks to take, uh, what lines to draw. We've tried to have it both ways, accommodating and containing, even though we say, of course, we're not trying to contain China. Uh, in significant part, I think we are. Uh, but we haven't made a clear choice about which way to tilt. And that, too, uh, increases the chances of miscalculation. And these conflicts over islands in the South China Sea, and especially the uh, islands that, that Japan claims, uh, it's not at all clear how far both sides can push. And the danger will be if a crisis uh, comes because of uncertainty about that, and we have to figure this out in time of crisis rather than figuring out with plenty of time to think about it beforehand. You grew up in the Cold War. You've seen many cycles of these kinds of things. Uh, even for a sort of somebody paid to worry about this stuff as a security studies uh, what uh, isn't the American national security environment and frankly the global national security environment these days remarkably uh, sanguine and, and secure compared to past eras? And, and isn't the big story one to be happy and confident about rather than uh, uh, worried and, and, and upset? It was for most of the 25 years since the Cold War, but it isn't now. I think recent events, uh, we have this uh, cascade of uh, changes in the stability uh, or basic security of the situation. The uh, uh, shocking advance of the Islamic State uh, cracking up Iraq, uh, what looks like a very uncertain, potentially uh, losing situation in Afghanistan, uh, the events in Crimea and Ukraine, and China flexing its muscles in the last couple of years over these uh, rather breathtaking claims in uh, uh, Western Pacific waters. These have all happened pretty recently and I think are ungluing uh, what had been uh, a revolutionary change in security that was in our favor. And ironically, one of the reasons we've gotten into so much trouble was that we were so secure after the Cold War. We were number one. American primacy, I think, led a lot of Americans to believe that we can make the world safe, uh, that we have the power, uh, that uh, there's uh, no other country or group that can fundamentally threaten us, and therefore uh, we could set things right. And uh, 
the problems that's led to uh, are now uh, getting pretty severe. For future discussions and future issues of foreign affairs and elsewhere, uh, Dick Betts, thank you very much. You're welcome.